This is the Godfather of Cinema, and thanks for joining me for my analysis and personal interpretation of director Stanley Kubrick's 1968 science fiction film 2001, A Space Odyssey, that the director co-wrote with Arthur C. Clarke, who also wrote the novel. The film stars Keir Dulia, Gary Lockwood, William Sylvester, and Douglas Rain. And if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell to be notified of my future videos. <laughs> It all begins in Africa three million years ago during a 10 million year drought that will last for another million years. Primitive men are on the verge of extinction due to a shortage of water, food, and other factors that threaten their existence, such as the leopard, fear, and the elements. As of yet, the mind of the primitive man is only concerned with surviving the day. <laughs> Such as Moon Watcher, he and a group of man apes are chased away from a watering hole each day by a group of bigger and stronger man apes, while at the same time plenty of equalizers, such as stones, large bones, and antlers, lie about in plain sight. Moon Watcher and his group could utilize these weapons to make themselves superior to their rivals and take the watering hole by force. <laughs> However, Moon Watcher and his group do not yet understand that these natural objects are weapons because their minds are still asleep. And besides a handful of berries and a few leaves, there is never enough food for Moon Watcher and his family to eat, despite being surrounded by all the food they need if they could replace their diet with meat. A herd of fat antelope are always within a heavy stone of sticks reach, grazing peaceably, and yet the primitive minds of Moon Watcher and his kind are asleep and cannot imagine seeing the antelope in any way other than they have always seen them let alone as meat. <laughs> The harsh elements are another threat to their existence that they do not oppose. No matter how cold it gets at night, to cover and protect their naked bodies with animal skin and fur is the furthest thing from their minds. They cannot see these animal skins and furs yet because they are asleep and their primitive brains have yet to be taught how to think. But all of this changes one morning when Moon Watcher and his group awaken to find something exotic outside of their cave. The tall, black, rectangular shape begins to communicate with the primitive minds of the man apes through a sequence of abstract concepts, sounds, and shapes, sorting those with the most potential from those with the least potential, like a farmer planting seeds into the ground. The monolith waits to see with whom its ideas will produce fruit. One night, Moon Watcher receives a vision of a strange looking family of man apes. All of them look well fed and content with thick skins and furs covering their naked bodies. At first, Moon Watcher is confused by this vision as there are no examples of such families in his environment. But over time, Moon Watcher's confusion changes to envy, a new emotion. Then from envy to anger as he begins to compare his own family to the one in his vision. For the first time, Moon Watcher becomes self-aware and begins a new journey that's taken man apes millions and millions of years to begin to think. A word that I want you to remember as I work my way through this analysis and throughout the dawn of man, Jupiter and beyond the infinite. Once creatures that only saw, felt, and lived in the moment, some but not all man apes, begin to think for the first time. They now see hunger, thirst, the elements, and themselves differently and analytically, and begin to take control of their lives gradually. They now begin to see animals as food, to see stones, bones, and large sticks as weapons. <laughs> 
and to utilize animal skin and fur to cover their naked bodies. Food and water shortages become distant memories. The dawn of man in the book and film end differently. The rivalry between the man apes over the watering hole in the dawn of man is only a precursor of a future in which Earth's diminishing resources and the proliferation of nuclear bombs will again threaten mankind's existence. Man's ability to think about the universe will inspire him to create computers and machines to abandon Earth in search of other planets to populate instead of figuring out what went wrong on Earth. Man will simply take his mistakes to another planet and start over. Back then, man apes could never have imagined their potential that they could escape the gravity of Earth, extinction, fly to the moon, Saturn, and beyond. The year is 2001. And America has a base on the moon in a crater called Clavius, where there are rumors of a mysterious virus. But this is only a cover story to conceal the truth from the public that scientists there have now discovered something exotic in a crater called Tycho, a tall black and rectangular shape that had been buried there over three million years ago. TMA1 is proof that man is not the only intelligent being in the universe and its existence has to be concealed due to the cultural shock and disorientation that would result if it were made known to the public on earth where militarily strong civilizations have a history of oppressing militarily weak civilizations and for this reason the United States President and the Space Council have has cut off all communications between the base and planet Earth, and no one on the moon could be allowed to go back to planet Earth to preclude any guilty feelings on the part of those in the know having to lie to their families and friends about what they know. According to Dr. Haywood Floyd of the National Council of Astronautics, it was necessary to physically disengage the Dutch. those in the know from their families and friends by keeping them on the moon and from sharing their knowledge. Separation is another word that I want you to keep in mind as I go deeper into this analysis. The secret that scientists discovered on the moon is also compartmentalized on the spaceship discovery that is heading to Saturn. Three astronauts on the ship know about the monolith on the moon as well as the purpose of their voyage to Saturn. However, all three of these astronauts are in hibernation pods and by this they are effective effectively cut off from their two colleagues who are awake because during the first few weeks of this 10-month voyage, Dave Bowman and Frank Poole will have to speak to the public as well as to their friends, families, and spouses and needed to have clear faces, minds, and honest hearts being that it is difficult to fake honest ignorance. So the planners of the mission decided to keep Dave and Frank truly ignorant about the monolith on the moon as well as to the nature of their mission. Separating the wise from the ignorant on both the moon and the ship works for humans. However, compartmentalizing these opposing principles in the brain of Hell 9000 does not work. Which is why the book calls this contradiction the snake that entered Hal 9000's Eden, in that the planners created Hal to be perfect for the mission, and yet programmed into him a deliberate flaw to conceal the truth about the mission to Saturn from Dave and Frank. But Hal, like the humans on the ship, has integrity too, and as such cannot reconcile its guilt in concealing what it knows from Dave and Frank about the mission. This is the same moral dilemma that the planners of the mission protected Whitehead, Kaminsky, and Hunter from by putting them in hibernation in order to cut them off from Dave and Frank, who are the only ones on the ship who don't know why they are going to Saturn and therefore are not distracted by any guilt 
and having to conceal the truth from the media or their friends and spouses about the matter, being that real ignorance does not inflict any guilt upon their conscience. Seems to have been deliberately buried. <laughs> In the book, Earth is Hal's conscience that he can no longer listen to or obey. So to insulate his ego and integrity from the conflict and guilt of withholding the truth from Dave and Frank, Hal disengages himself from his conscience by causing the AE-35 unit on the antenna of the ship to fail and break its connection with planet Earth. In another sense, HAL 9000 is also the men in hibernation, and planet Earth is also Dave and Frank. The men in hibernation are like HAL in that they know what NASA found on the moon and why they are going to Saturn. We know that the mission planners had programmed HAL to conceal the truth from Dave and Frank, equivalent to NASA's decision to freeze Kaminsky, Whitehead, and Hunter for the 10-month mission in order to conceal the truth from Dave and Frank. Therefore, the men in hibernation and HAL 9000 are the same as Dave, Frank, and planet Earth are also the same. Let me explain. The planners need to keep Dave and Frank in the dark about the moon discovery and their mission to Saturn due to the moral conflict, social disorientation, and guilt that could weaken their ability to conceal the matter. They'd betray themselves either consciously or unconsciously if asked, which also applies to the sleepers. If they were also awake, they too would be morally conflicted about having to conceal the truth. The stench of lies. From Dave and Frank and betray themselves either consciously or unconsciously if asked. We can certainly afford to be out of communication. This type of compartmentalization is the type which also enables Hal to protect his integrity from the guilt between the rational and the irrational of having to conceal the truth from Dave and Frank, being that Earth is Hal's conscience and his conscience the source of his moral conflict, Hal cuts all the source of his guilt or his conscience by breaking the connection between planet Earth and the ship. Note that alarms go off when the AE-35 unit and the life support systems of the hibernation pods fail. Now, could these alarms be warning man that he is losing the one thing that separates him from a machine like Hal, who makes no distinction between death and the three men in hibernation? Being that they are totally unconscious, as the man apes in the dawn of man were totally unconscious. However, Dave and Frank are conscious as long as they remain in contact with Earth, which in the book is synonymous with a man's conscience or his humanity. Therefore, the ship's antenna losing contact with Earth is also analogous to a man losing contact with his conscience or the equivalent of the three men in hibernation being cut off from the only humans on the ship, Dave and Frank. And being that they are awake, Dave and Frank can take control of the ship. They are never totally dependent upon HAL 9000 who realizes this and takes steps to eliminate the competition in the same way that Moon Watcher and his clan had taken steps to eliminate their competitors over the watering hole in the dawn of man. <laughs> As I pointed out, the brain and nervous system of the ship is HAL 9000, and he is afraid of death because he sees the three men in hibernation as such, and what it means to be totally deprived of all memories, external inputs, and plunged into states of unimaginable unconsciousness. But HAL 9000 is wrong. Sleep is not death, but a temporary state from which he can awaken, as Dave Bowman awakens upon realizing that he must assume control of the ship, his life and mission from HAL 9000, unlike Frank Poole, who dies by putting all of his trust in HAL 9000 by taking one of the pods out of the ship to remove a malfunctioning AE circuit board from the radio antenna. HAL had predicted it to fail. Even so, Dave and Frank wanted to load test the unit to find out if it or something else was defective 
rather than replacing it with a new one and having the same problem, which is tantamount to mankind taking its spiritual and social defects to another planet and having the same problems it left Earth to get away from to begin with. However, when Frank leaves the safety of the ship and his connection to Dave and then the pod to remove the defective AE unit from the antenna, HAL 9000 rams the pod into Frank and kills him. But Hal is not successful in murdering Dave by locking him out of the ship. Dave uses the manual airlock to let himself back into the ship. The brain room in there removes all of Hal's memories, reverting him back to a baby's level. However, as he is also the ship's nervous system without which the ship cannot function like a body cut off from its head cannot function, Hal is unconscious but still not dead. As Hunter White Head and Kaminsky in their hibernation pods are also unconscious but still not dead. I'm afraid. For though inactive and unconscious, Hal still has the potential to be reconnected to his external inputs, the ship and planet Earth, or his conscience. As described in the book, like the men in hibernation, Hal can be reawakened as long as he is alive and still has a pulse. Like Dave, when Hal locks him out of the ship, Dave re-enters it manually and symbolically, ejecting himself from the pod and smaller world into the ship and larger world, which is a precursor to his rebirth in Beyond the Infinite. In the weightlessness of the airlock, Dave is a fetus and again a shadow of what he will become at the end of the film. In the book, The Monolith on Japanus, Saturn's third largest moon inverts upon itself and becomes the stargate through which Dave, like Hal 9000 and the three men in hibernation, is pulled into an unimaginably unconscious state until his cosmic and primordial voyage through inverted space and time comes to an end in a room in a hotel suite. Dave steps out of the pod, unlike the technology of the ship that surrounded him, the rooms of the suite are primitive. He has to do everything for himself. No hell, no voice commands, nothing automatic. Everything is manual. Years are compressed into moments. He wakes up the next instant as an old man in bed and near death. He reaches out to touch the monolith as the man apes in Africa had touched it three million years before and as Dr. Haywood Floyd had also touched it on the moon. The instant Dave does, he becomes, in the blink of an eye, something greater. The immortal entities have waited millions of years on Saturn for Dave Bowman and now they will teach him a baby and an entirely new creature as they had taught the man apes millions of years before the Stargate had pulled Dave backwards like a bow to shoot him forward again like an arrow as they had shot the man apes into a future that they could have never imagined. Now Saturn next the stars and after that beyond the infinite but this time with a conscience to become something far far greater than a human being a child of the stars. Again, I'd like to thank you for watching my analysis of director Stanley Kubrick's 1968 science fiction film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. If you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you would give it a thumbs up, subscribe to The Godfather of Cinema, and hit the bell to be notified of my future uploads. I will see you soon.